Alaska. The word is derived from an Eskimo term meaning the great land. And great it is, great in size and beauty, and great in wildlife and in natural wealth. Bought by the United States and the Russian government in 1867 for seven million dollars through the negotiations of Secretary of State William Seward, it was at first referred to contemptuously as Seward's folly and also as War Russia, so bleak and barren did it seem. But now it is recognized for what one writer has called its outrageous magnificence. And visitors quickly develop Alaska fever. I was fortunate enough during my sabbatical leave in 1981 to spend the month of August there in the company of several friends. Our first stop was Cold Bay at the western tip of the Alaska Peninsula. Beyond it is the chain of the Aleutian Islands, which are the peaks of a range of submarine mountains stretching for a thousand miles to within 600 of the Soviet Union. Cold Bay, formerly Fort Randall Military Base, is a bit of a shanty town of 120 inhabitants, and the Flying Tiger Hotel in which we stayed is really a bit of a shack. Moreover, during the Japanese occupation of the two outmost Aleutian Islands in World War II, the Americans stationed 10,000 troops around Coral Bay. When they withdrew after the war, left their huts to rust and rot. Yet neither these nor the wreckage of aircraft can destroy the beauty of the natural wilderness. God's garden continues to blossom and to display the beauties of blue monkshood and the coastal paintbrush. My fellow adventurers were Keith and Gladys Hunt, who have been friends for 25 years and are among the most senior staff members of the American InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Our arrival at Coal Bay coincided with the salmon run. The chum, or dog salmon, their silvery sides streaked with red fingers, were fighting their way up the streams to spawn, and then, immediately, to die. Keith and Rusty caught some whoppers, and Keith got some Dolly Varden trout as well. So there was plenty of fish to eat, and one day we picked huge salmon berries, too, for our picnic lunch, washed down by a bottle of red wine, gratis, which Keith had found half buried in the river bed. Decapitated salmon heads were evidence of the presence of salmon-eating bears, as were also their paw marks in the sand, though we didn't see any. The tiny six-inch bared sandpiper was feeding at the river's edge, while rock sandpipers had already begun their southerly migration. And the northern or red-necked phalaropes were already in their eclipse plumage. We found a family of red fox cubs, which were pretty to watch as they frolicked outside their earth under the eye of an old vixen, but foxes are a menace to wildlife and have all but destroyed the population of Aleutian Canada geese. From Cold Bay, we flew to the Pribilof Islands, a little volcanic archipelago isolated in the North Pacific between the Aleutians and the Bering Straits. The islands are named after the Russian navigator Gerasim Pribilov, who in 1786 discovered this breeding ground of the northern fur seal. There are said to be as many as a million and a half seals in the herd today. The bulls arrive first in May, weighing up to 600 pounds. Each establishes his territory, fighting his rivals, and becomes a so-called beach master. The cows arrive in June. Each bull now collects a harem of about 30 cows, all of which have been pregnant for a whole year, and they give birth to their pups 
just two days after reaching the breeding ground. The pups are soon gathered into pup pods for warmth, protection and social life. Their parents now largely ignore them and they even have to teach themselves to swim. Then, when back on land, the so-called rookery is a seething mass of barking, bellowing, sleeping, fighting seals, all emitting a powerful odour. Meanwhile, the young bachelor seals lie out on so-called hauling grounds, and from these, when they're between three and four years old, the annual cull is taken, limited to 25,000 by the American Fur Seal Act of 1966. Offshore, a boat is waiting to ship the treated pelts to Seattle. They're then transported by train or truck to the company in Greenville, South Carolina, which since 1915 has had a monopoly in Pribilof Island seal skins. We stayed on St. Paul Island. To be precise, in the King Ida Hotel, and incidentally we saw some King Ida ducks too. The population of St. Paul consists of 120 Aleut families. Like the Eskimos, the Aleuts came from Mongolia and crossed the Bering Straits when there was still a land bridge about 9,000 years ago. The Aleuts are a friendly, peace-loving people. Having been brought to the Pribilofs by the Russians for the seal fur trade, the Aleuts all became Russian Orthodox Christians. They still are, except that they no longer belong to the Moscow Patriarchate, but come under the jurisdiction of Metropolitan Theodosius of New York. There's also a Protestant church on the island belonging to the Assemblies of God, built by Pastor Al Kapener, pictured here with his wife. Though sadly, perhaps understandably, there is some tension between the two churches. Nearby are their two separate graveyards. It's sad enough when living Christians are segregated, but you'd think they might at least be united when they're dead. Birds seem more gregarious than Christians, however. The cliff ledges were crowded with nests. Keith Gladys and I spent as much time as we could on the cliff tops, with the beach some 300 feet below, where the rock sandpipers were feeding. The top ledges of the cliffs were occupied by murres, which in Britain we call guillemots. This is a group of common murres. But here is a thick-billed murre, which we in Europe call Brunix guillemot. It's distinguished from the common species not only by its thicker bill, but by the narrow white streak at the base of its mouth. Not far below the murres were the red-faced cormorants. It's quite a rare bird, whose range is limited to the Aleutian Islands and the Pribilofs. While at the other end of the size scale were the tubby little parakeet auklets with an almost circular red bill. I freely confess that my favourite birds were the puffins. This is the horned puffin, which is really very similar to the North Atlantic variety. But it has a tiny horn above the eye from which it gets its name. More dramatic still are the tufted puffins. Their body is entirely black, while their bill is scarlet and gold. And when they turn their heads away from you, you see the rather foppish, beige tufts which give them their name. Occupying the same ledges were the kittiwakes. Not the black-legged variety of the North Atlantic, but red-legged kittiwakes, which are restricted to a few Aleutian and Siberian islands. So proud of their red legs did they seem to be that they dangled them rather self-consciously in flight. Yes, and in aerial combat too. This is the reason why the seabirds nest in such cramped quarters on inaccessible cliff ledges, the American blue fox. No nesting burrows on land would be safe against this unscrupulous predator. 
The foxes don't disturb the flowers, however. We just revel in the arctic poppies, and in this dainty little white bearing sea chickweed. It was sad to say goodbye to St Paul and to the Pribilof Islands and their fantastic seals and seabirds. We returned to Anchorage, which is situated at the head of Cook Inlet, named after Captain Cook, who mapped some of the Alaskan coast on his third and fatal voyage of exploration. At this point, the Hunts and I were joined by Jim and Rita Houston of Regent College, Vancouver. And we were blessed by the great kindness of Chuck and Betty Obendorf, who lent us their Oldsmobile station wagon. In this, we drove north to Mount McKinley National Park, on to Fairbanks, right up to Circle, to the northeast where the road ends, and then down south to Port Valdez, where we took the ferry across to Whittier and so returned to Anchorage. Our first stop then was Mount McKinley National Park, several thousand square miles of unspoiled, untamed nature reserve. High above us, as we drove, no more than white dots on the mountain side were wild, curly-horned, dull sheep. Closer at hand was the arctic ground squirrel, with rufous front and silver-spotted grey back. It hibernates in an underground burrow throughout the long, cold winter. One of the squirrel's chief enemies is the goshawk, waiting here silent and motionless for its prey. This one had caught a snowshoe hare, which was too heavy to fly away with and much too delicious to forfeit. We were specially on the lookout, however, for the barren grounds grizzly bear of northwest Canada and Alaska. Bears are dangerous, the notices warned, so we kept a respectable distance and found ourselves singing, The bear went over the mountain, the bear went over the mountain, etc. We also watched a sow digging for a hapless squirrel or marmot, excavating pawfuls of earth and rock, surrounded by her three hungry cubs. When we reached the high ground, and a herd of caribou or North American reindeer stampeded in the snow, we half expected Father Christmas to appear. Our destination was Camp Denali, that cluster of houses halfway up the mountain, which is a Christian establishment just beyond the western boundary of Mount McKinley National Park. We stayed about a mile away in the Hawk's Nest, which consists of a couple of log cabins on this hillock. From here we looked out over spruce trees and tundra to the distant mountain range. But we were astonished our first morning to wake up to a snowscape more reminiscent of December than of August. The Christmas feel continued as we came across a small herd of caribou in the snow. We stalked these two bulls, each with a huge rack quietly chewing the cud, and living in meek coexistence before the battles of the rutting season began. Nearby men were dredging for gold, while the grey jays kept to the forest. So did the willow ptarmigan, which is equivalent to our Scottish grouse. All this time the high mountains were hidden in cloud, especially Mount McKinley, or Mount Denali, the Great One, as Athapascan Indians call it, of truly Himalayan proportions. But one exciting evening the clouds lifted and the most magnificent mountain panorama came into view. It's the beginning of the great Alaska range which ends with the Aleutian Islands. On the extreme left is Mount Brooks at 11,960 feet and on the extreme right the majestic mass of Mount McKinley over 20,000 feet. The peaks were beautifully reflected in Nugget Pond. And now, 
As we watch the changing moods of the mountains, first Mount Brooks and then Mount McKinley, in the evening light, in the sunset glow, and as a ghostly white silhouette against the blue night sky, I think perhaps music will be a better commentary than words. During our drive back through the National Park, we had a few good glimpses of well-camouflaged rock ptarmigan. Of another grizzly bear, this time in the snow. Of a red fox by the roadside. And of a cow moose, the largest member of the deer family, which feeds on willow, birch, aspen and alder twigs. And is seen here long-legged and ungainly, with her two calves. We now drove north to Fairbanks, visiting Cripple Creek on the way, which reminded us of the gold rush days, as did also the priceless warning notice against shooting in the local pub. Some 60 miles northeast of Fairbanks, we spent two nights in a log cabin which had been built and then abandoned by a trapper about ten years previously. All round us the deciduous trees were already turning yellow. So it was too late for flowers, though not for toadstools or berries. Near Eagle Summit we saw the rare hawk owl, a bird of the northern forests, as we drove one hundred miles further northeast to Circle City, with its 68 inhabitants, for here, at the River Yukon, the road ends, while beyond are perhaps 200,000 square miles of Alaskan wilderness without any roads at all. On our way south again, we had many spectacular views, here of the Wrangell Mountains, and with the broad pass at the foot of Worthington Glacier, we also passed an eccentric horseman who told us he'd come from California and been on the road for nearly six months. And all the way we were following the Great Alaskan Pipeline, opened in 1977. Half of it is buried, and the other half on special mountings to minimise danger from earthquake or melting permafrost. The pipe, 48 inches in diameter, transports a million and a half barrels of crude oil daily. Beginning at Prudhoe Bay in the Arctic Ocean, it ends here, 800 miles to the south, at Valdez, which is America's most northerly ice-free port. The following day we took the ferry across Prince William Sound from Valdez to Whittier, and were escorted some of the way by black and white doll porpoises while the Chugach Mountains acted as a beautiful backdrop. It's high up these, 40 miles away, that the Columbia Glacier begins. The ice cliffs, where the glacier ends, look impressive enough when one is still a mile away. But when the boat comes nearer, they are truly awe-inspiring, some 350 feet high. Every few minutes, great blocks of ice fall into the sea with a thunderous roar and splash. And the ice which falls off the cliffs today 
began a snowfall on the mountains more than 2,000 years ago. It then forms beautiful icebergs of varying shapes and sizes, onto which brown harbour seals can clamber, and which they find convenient for sunbathing. The rest of our ferry trip was uneventful, except perhaps for a great colony of nesting kittiwakes on a perpendicular cliff face. And for the receding portage glacier and its icebergs, not far from Whittier, where we landed. Our final expedition was to the Katmai National Park on the Alaskan Peninsula. Here we stayed at Brooks Lodge on the shores of Lake Naknek. We appreciated the welcome we received from a glaucous winged gull and from a young porcupine as well. The following day Gladys, Keith and I enjoyed a marvellous expedition to the famous Valley of 10,000 Smokes, discovered by the explorer Robert Griggs in 1915 following the eruption of Mount Katmai three years before. The flat-topped mountain on the right is named Mount Griggs after him. When Robert Griggs first set eyes on the valley, steam was issuing from thousands of vents or fissures, hence the name he gave the valley. There's no smoke now, only clouds of wind-blown dust. The eruption deposited millions of tons of volcanic ash on the valley floor about 70 feet deep. And the river Yukak, its swirling waters dark brown with silt, has gouged a deep ravine through the valley right down to the sandstone bedrock. Brooks River, which flows by the lodge, was positively congested with red or sockeye salmon on the spawning run. So congested, in fact, that even a moron could hardly fail to catch one. Salmon fishing is not confined to human beings, however. The Alaskan grizzly is also a keen fisherman. Sometimes floating, almost submerged in midstream, and sometimes coming to shore to enjoy the feast. Grizzly bears are normally berry eaters, as their droppings clearly reveal. Either bright red cranberries or blueberries. But during the salmon run, they take to the river in order to build up their stock of fat before their long winter hibernation begins. They will often eat as many as eight salmon in one meal. I found myself exchanging bird watching for bear watching, so impressed was I with the magnificence of the Alaskan grizzly bear. In fact, I rather resent his Latin name, Ursus Horribilis, and hereby, with great respect and admiration, rename him Ursus Mirabilis, the marvellous bear.